Um, so welcome to our session two of um, the math professional learning series. Last week we looked at um, why we do new math um, and kind of what that looks like um, for our students and that we're working on um, conceptual understanding versus just a procedural understanding. And so today we're going to move forward in our series and do um, some addition strategies. We'll also look at a game that you might be able to play easily with students or students could play at home as well as a routine um, that maybe you could use with your students. Um, so I again want to welcome you. Um, we'll keep everybody on mute if we can. Um, we are recording so that um, anybody who couldn't make the live session can view it later. Um, you will get a contact hour for participating today. So at the end of our session, I have tried to make it a little easier for us today. Um, I have shortened the survey that you'll do at the end of the session. Um, we'll still have a sm small link or a QR code that you can scan, but if you need those contact hour certificates, please be sure to um, get those, either the link or scan the QR code before you leave today. Um, if you have trouble with that, feel free to email me. My email address will be on the screen as well. Um, I know that worked for some folks last week. If you participated last week, you all should have received your contact hours certificate by now. If you've not done that or haven't gotten that yet, please feel free to um, reach out to me and we can make sure that um, we get that to you. I'm very sorry for those of you who maybe got your certificates more than one time last week. Um, like I said, I've tried to uh, streamline the process a little bit um, better so that hopefully I can get them all out to you um, throughout the week, but hopefully not as many duplicates will go out um, trying to learn um, on my own as well. And so um, I'm here to, here to share that with you guys. So we're learning all together. So I'm going to share my screen. And you should be seeing um, a PowerPoint that just says session two, addition strategies and routines. And if you give me just a moment, I'm going to pull up some screens. There we go. So when we think about um, standard algorithms, what we know as standard algorithms, the when we do addition, we're talking about we stack and we add. Subtracting is that stack and subtracting make the trades. With multiplication, um, it's that stack. We multiply in the ones place, we put our placeholder zero in, multiply across, and then we're adding, and division is long division. Um, that's what we call the standard algorithm. And so when we think about where those standard algorithms show up in the common core or in our main state standards, which are closely linked with the Common Core, um, might be surprised to see that um, addition and subtraction actually show up um, to fluently understand the standard algorithm um, is in grade four. Now, it doesn't mean that we're not doing addition um, much, much earlier than that. We actually start some addition in kindergarten, first grade, um, but we don't actually see that standard algorithm until later, um, maybe even the end of second grade, third grade, before we're actually seeing the standard algorithm, um, and then they need to have that down fluently by the end of grade four. So, um, and you can see their subtraction, we'll focus on subtraction next week, uh, multiplication will be the week after, and then division, but um, some of you might be surprised to see that those standard algorithms aren't until much later, um, because we do um, introduce those much earlier. So we are going to take a look at um, a video. Last week we did, we watched a video as well from Graham Fletcher from his website, gfletchy.com. And on this site today, we're going to actually look at his addition and subtraction um, progressions. And so it's addition and subtraction together, even though we're focusing on addition um, in our session today, um, you will see subtraction as well, because often we don't teach them independently of one another. We actually teach them together, um, and some of the strategies that we use kind of bridge between addition and subtraction. Um, even though we might have a subtraction problem, we might solve it with addition. Um, it doesn't mean that um, we, we aren't using um, what we know about number sense. So we'll watch this video. It's uh, about a seven minute video and you should hear the sound. If you're not, please let me know.
There's so much happening in the early years of school that at times it's hard to make sense of it all. So here's my attempt to make sense of the progression of addition and subtraction. So addition and subtraction begin in kindergarten when students begin to count. They begin to count objects and sets. They do this by counting forwards and they also do it by counting backwards. A big thing to remember is when we're counting forwards or backwards that we include the number zero. And when we're counting backwards, let's not have them include blast off because blast off isn't necessarily a number. As students work on counting, they begin to count sets. So here a student will have four in one hand, three in another hand, and they're not able to put those two sets together. There'll always be a set of four and a set of three. Then as students move from counting sets to joining sets, they're able to combine the four and three. So four and three more is seven, or four plus three is seven. As students begin to work on this idea of joining sets, we introduce five frames. And to be honest, I don't know if they get enough play in the early grades. So we'll have four and three, and students begin to build an understanding of five frames and filling up a five frame. Students can see that four plus three is the same as five plus two. And this understanding will build with students when they begin to use 10 frames later on. So in terms of subtracting, students can have four minus three and use a separate model, or they can also use a compare model. The big piece here is that a context should always drive the strategy that students are using. So as students are working on addition and subtraction, they're simultaneously working on this understanding of counting and collecting and grouping things in 10. So here 13 could be seen and should be seen as 10 and three more or 10 plus three. It's here that this whole idea of unitizing is introduced. It's massive and we need to make sure that students don't leave kindergarten and first grade without this understanding conceptually. So as students dive into first grade, they begin to explore sums greater than 10. So what might that look like? Well here, a student can take nine plus seven, model it with a 10 frame. And because they've worked on this idea of unitizing or they're beginning to, they know that it's most efficient to say fill up a 10 frame. So they take one from the seven, give it to the nine to make a 10, and they're left with six. Here students are beginning to think flexibly about numbers and the same understanding applies to double digit numbers. The big piece here is that students, as long as they're using concrete models, they're also drawing representations. So what did we do? We wanna make a 10. So we're going to take our ones and bundle them up to make another 10. Decompose the eight into a three and a five, give three to the 37 to make 40 and have five more. So what does this look like with subtraction in first grade? Well, in first grade, students are only subtracting multiples of 10. And here, 37 minus 20, they can see if they remove two tens, they're left with 17. So what happens in second grade? How does this build on what they've learned in first grade? Well, they might use two two-digit numbers. And here is where we begin to introduce base 10 blocks because of that whole idea of unitizing that students are still developing in kindergarten and first. Again, just like before, we'll draw a representation for our model. We'll create another bundle of 10. And here's how students can begin to move from the concrete to the representation to the abstract. Now, it might not be efficient, or students might see that it's not efficient to write it out on the side all the time. So to become more efficient, they can begin to use this understanding of partial sums and find a shortcut. Eight plus three is 11, 40 plus 30 is 70. And this understanding of partial sums, well, it leads brilliantly into their understanding that they begin to develop with partial products in fourth grade. So that works for addition, but does it work for subtraction? Well, we wanna try and use models that continue to work the same and consistently throughout math. We don't want them to expire. So here we wanna have 83 and we'll go back to that separating model. We wanna put 29 inside there. Well, we need six more. So 
this is a really big understanding for students where they make that fair trade and that idea of unitizing. So now we can take the six from the 10 and we're left with four. So how can we move again from the concrete to the representation to the abstract? Again, all, all, everything that we're doing here and all the work that we're doing, we're not undermining place value. And what's great is that this model, this understanding that we're building, well, it also applies to larger numbers as well. Now we can use place value mats, we can use just open sheets of paper such as this, but anyway, students are still acting out that fair trade and they're making sense, the regrouping of numbers. So what does this look like as we begin to write it as an algorithm? We'll regroup the 20 into a 10 in another group. It's all about students seeing the math conceptually and we're not undermining place value. So as students dive into third and fourth grade, they have two years to begin to formalize this understanding of subtraction and addition with regrouping and unitizing. But the big thing is that it's built through conceptual understanding. The standard algorithm isn't an expectation until the end of fourth grade, right before students dive into decimals with fifth grade. And you know what? In third and fourth grade, if students need to use expanded form to make sense of what they're doing, let them do it. It's all about the conceptual understanding and allowing students to visualize the math. So there's lots happening. Let's, as we've said before, let's take our time. The turtle won the race. Love to continue the conversation on Twitter or hit me up on my blog. Thanks for watching. So this was just kind of a quick overview of all the different strategies um, that you might see in some addition and subtraction. And we're going to go through each of those strategies um, individually. I do want to start with some of those hands-on manipulative pieces that um, are so important for students. And so I'm going to share with you um, a virtual manipulative um, so that you can see the manipulatives that I'm talking about, the tools that I'm talking about. So let me share here. You should be seeing, um, I'm on this website called toytheater.com. So T-O-Y-T-H-E-A-T-E-R.com. And when you come to toytheater.com, if you scroll to the bottom of the first page, you get these virtual manipulatives. And when I click on virtual manipulatives, there's all kinds of manipulatives um, that can be used with students um, or students can use. And so if you're working with fractions or decimals or um, clocks, there's all of those kind of materials. Um, but when we start to think about our earliest learners, we start working with um, either a five frame or a 10 frame. And so if you teach in older grades, you may not, um, you may never have seen a five frame or a 10 frame before. I came from teaching sixth and seventh grade math and science, and I had never seen um, a 10 frame. I didn't know what that was until I worked with younger students. So if you haven't seen that, this is considered a um, five frame. So it sets students up to recognize what five looks like. Um, and so in this case, students would use counters or chips and you can put out um, different combinations. So here I would show two plus three is five. Um, I could move them and I can say um, three plus two is five, or I can say four plus one is five. So that is what a, a five frame is. And then very similar to a five frame is a 10 frame. And so 10 frame is essentially two fives together and you get your 10. And we typically fill a 10 frame from the top left 
going across because we know that that's five. So we take that five frame model and we set it into a 10 frame model. So here we see we can have um, five or six. Here we have six red and four make 10. Um, students also can recognize that they know that this is 10 when they see it. So if they see this box that has eight in it, they might know that it's eight by seeing six red, two yellow is eight. They may also recognize that this is a tens frame. And so there are five, uh, there are two empty boxes. So 10 take away two is eight. So they're starting to see that relationship between the numbers. So it's really based on conceptually understanding um, about numbers. They have number sense. And so that is a 10 frame. Um, you might also see some students might use or some classrooms might use a rec and rec. Um, this is something that I have used um, a little bit. Some folks love these, um, others um, can kind of give or take them. But again, you see the representation of this is 10. You know that this is five. You can recognize this is five. So those five all together, I don't need to count them one, two, three, four, five. I just recognize them as five. So if I see this, I can recognize five and two more is seven. Or I can say five, six, seven. Um, so using five frames and 10 frames and then the rec and recs um, are just ways to represent numbers where students are starting to actually have the concrete models um, to represent the addition problems that they're working with. We might also see students using their fingers. They always have their fingers with them so um, they recognize that that's five very quickly. You have two hands, five and five is 10. Um, so that's a great model for 10. One game that students might practice when they're working on their combinations of 10, because that's um, a first grade skill, something that we see very often um, is combinations. Students are working on those numbers that make 10. Um, we might play a game called uh, fishing for 10. So it's just like go fish, but instead of asking for a matching card, so if I have an eight, I wouldn't ask for an eight, I would ask for the card that would make 10. So if I have an eight in my hand, I'm asking for the two. Um, if I had a five in my hand, I would be asking for a five. If I had a one in my hand, I'd be asking for a nine. And so instead of having matching pairs, you have a combination that work to make 10. And that's a great way for um, younger students to practice working on um, making combinations of 10. While I have up the virtual manipulatives, I do want to show you um, the number grid. Um, so we're going to use a hundreds chart. Last week in the video, we saw that some hundreds charts um, actually go from um, 100 down to zero, or they build from the bottom up um, so that students are working in the direction in which they're either adding, so they're moving up, or if they're subtracting, they're moving down. I'm just going to use a standard 100 chart. So if a student is doing addition here in first grade, we know that they're working on adding tens. So if I'm starting with the number 24, students will learn that adding 10 more means that we're adding one row, which means that we're transitioning down one, um, one row on the chart, so it's 34. We also start to look for patterns in our ones and tens. Um, if we're adding on, if we were at 34, and we are adding on 12. We know that 12 is a 10 and two more ones. So we can add on a 10 and two ones. So 34 plus 12 is 46. Um, and so that is um, one way that we use that number grid. Students start working around, um, of moving around this number grid very fluently. Um, they might have 42 and they're adding 25. So 42 plus 25, I'm going to add on two tens and five ones. So it's really understanding the number sense. They understand um, the number 25 is two tens and five ones. So 42 plus 10 plus another 10 is 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, and 25. So 42 plus 25 is 67. So it's a model for students to use. Um, they're working on addition. 
they've got a model and they've got some sort of tool that they're using um, to to model that addition problem. So they're not using the standard algorithm here. They're not stacking and adding 42 plus 25 to get 67. They have a different way. They're understanding how numbers are put together. I'm going to stop share. Um, I'm going to attempt to use my whiteboard here behind me. So I'm hoping that you'll be able to see that um, as I come up. I'm not sure. I'm hoping that it's going to record. Jen, before you step away, there were two questions in Thank the you. chat box. Um, how much playing time should be allowed for students? And so when we first give students the first set of manipulatives, when we're introducing students to manipulatives, we certainly want them to be able to explore those tools. So letting them play um, with them at first as an exploration is a great idea. So they might take a day in math class and that's what they're doing is they're exploring the new tools. And then we start to use those tools in a mathematical way. So we're, we're sharing with them um, how they would use them as a resource. And then the tools are something that I actually might have available for them. If you have inside recess, it's a great way to let students play and explore with the math. Um, and they might just be playing with the manipulatives, but you're getting them in their hands and they're getting used to them so that when you do give them a math task, they're not going to necessarily play with them. They're able to attend to the task and use them as a tool because they've been able to get that play out of the, out of the way. So I have um, the second question and then a new one just came in. Is this resource free that you shared, the virtual manipulatives? Yes, the toytheater.com is a free resource. Um, so you could share it with parents because they may like those manipulatives, um, but you could use it with students, um, whether virtually or even once we get back to a classroom setting, you might be able to use that manipulative, uh, the manipulatives with um, your students. But yes, the Toy Theater is a free resource um, and there's all kinds of preset games in there that have to do with math and um, subitizing and, and all those um, younger strategies, but you also have all the tools that kind of span the elementary grades. And then there was a question, what about touch math? So touch points um, for math, there's many different sides of that. Some folks really um, love touch points. Some really don't love touch points. My take on that is if that's what is helping students learn, if students can use that and use that successfully, then that's a strategy that they have. Eventually, we would love for them to move to more efficient strategies where they're not having to um, count out by touching the number. But if that's how students are working and they're working accurately and efficiently that way, then I would say let students use that. I, I know that for myself, when I get tired, um, I, I will use my fingers, I will touch on my fingers, or I might tap out a number. Um, and that's just a strategy that we've come accustomed to that we use because um, it's quick and efficient. So um, I know some sides are pro touch, mat, touch points, some are not, um, but I feel whatever works for students and what can help students move forward um, is a strategy for students to use. So thank you for the questions. Thank you, Michelle, for helping to um, moderate that. I'm hoping that you'll be able to see my board. Um, so one of the other strategies that we came up to talking about, um, or will come up is doubles. So once students have work, they've been working in their um, combinations of tens, we now start with doubles. And so I'm sure you understand doubles, four plus four equals eight. So if students know four plus four, five plus five, six plus six, we can now use those as helper facts. So we might say, what is four plus five? Well, if we know that four plus four is eight, and we know that five is one more than four, then we can say that the sum has to be one more than eight. So it's nine. We can also use that in the reverse. If I had four plus three, four plus four is eight. So four plus three, three is one less than four. So my sum is gonna be one less than the double. So it's going to be a seven. So we call these, um, 
uh, doubles facts or double plus one, double minus one. Um, and it's definitely um, a way for students to start making sense of what they know and moving forward to, to starting to um, use their number sense to help them with addition facts. And then we saw Graham Fletcher model the base 10 blocks. So it's really important to get those base 10 blocks out, have students using those blocks. But then once we get to a point where we are ready to do some writing, we need to understand how to model that. So we might use base 10 blocks to model um, 34 plus 72. So we might actually draw out these base 10 blocks. So I'm going to model 34. 10, 20, 30, 1, 2, 3, 4, plus 72, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 72. I can now put these together and I see that I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 tens. Well, I know something about 10 tens. 10 tens is 100. So I'm going to make a trade and I can show that I've traded these in for a hundreds grid and I have four ones and two more ones so I have six ones. I like to write them out either in pairs of two and, and make two columns um, so that I can look at those and see them. That's called subitizing when I can just look at a um, set and not have to count them all up. I also like to write them in either a row of five. So again, we're going back to that five frame or a 10 frame, and I'm thinking about how I can see those numbers. Um, if we're doing um, something like 39 plus 54, again, I'm going to draw that out 10, 20, 30. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, plus 54. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 tens, 4 ones. So a student really has to understand place value and has to understand the connection between these numbers and the base 10 blocks. So I'm looking here, I need one more 1 to make this another 10. So I'm going to take it out of here and I'm going to make this into another 10. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And I still have three ones. One, two, three. So I have 93. So really getting students to understand place value, understand number sense using those base 10 blocks. They will be using base 10 blocks. They should be using them in second grade, third grade, fourth grade. They may actually use them. Um, base 10 blocks are also very helpful when we get to subtraction. Jen, yeah. if you could make your dots larger and bigger. darker, we can see them. Right now, Perfect. we don't see them. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. We're actually going to move on from base 10 blocks to our open number line. So we all know what a number line is, right? We have a number line. Typically, number lines for our elementary students start at um, zero, or they start really at zero and they move up. Students haven't looked at numbers less than zero yet, so that's how we look at um, a number line in our younger elementary grades. But with an open number line, we can set where this number line starts. It's not um, a typical number line, would have evenly spaced tick marks. On an open number line, it's actually not marked out, and a student can use that to show jumps in a different way. So if I want to show 37 plus 51, Here's my number line, and I'm actually going to start at 37. So I'm going to make a mark, and I'm going to mark it out as 37. And I know that 51 is 5 tens and 1 1. So I'm going to jump by tens. So I'm going to add 10 each time. So from 37, I'm now at 47, 57. 67, 77, 
87. So I've jumped five tens and now one more hop to 88. So a student can make jumps based on um, the distances that they know where they could break it down. If I knew that 37 plus 20 was 57, I could make a jump of 20. So an open number line allows students to use what they know about decomposing a number and using those numbers as their hops. We can also use this for um, three digit numbers. If I wanted to, I can do 253 plus 321. Again, I'm going to start my number line. I'm going to start it at 253. So this is an open number line. I can start it wherever I want. I know that I need to add on 321. I can just make a jump of 300 because I know something about these numbers. I know that 253 plus 300 is 553. Because I know how to add, just add on my hundreds. I can then add on two tens or 20. I, I can do that. So 553 plus 20 is 573. And I have one more. So I get to 574. If a student didn't know how to add 20 to 553, they could make two jumps of 10. So an open number line allows students to use what they know to move their math forward. So if I didn't know how to jump by 300, I could jump by three jumps of 100, and then two jumps of 10, and then a jump of one. Sometimes students also like to jump to a friendlier number. So if I had something like 49 plus 37, I start at 49. A student might say, well, I've got to jump 37. I'm going to jump one to get to 50. And now I only need to jump another 36. Well, I can do that. And I land on 86. So they could actually take apart their jumps in whatever way would make sense to them. So using 49 plus one more made sense to, start to go to 50 because from 50 they could then add on a larger number. They still could have broken apart the 37 into three tens and seven ones. But as they start to have more number sense and be able to add on larger numbers, they're becoming more efficient with that strategy. We also might think about compensation. So 49 plus 37, instead of using the number line, a student might go, I know that 49 is one away from 50. So I'm going to think about this problem as 50. I've added one to this guy. So now I need to take one away from this one. So 50 plus 36 is 86. Think about what students really have to understand about numbers and number sense when they're doing strategies like this. They're making sense of the problem and the, and the value of the numbers versus just adding, stacking them and adding them up and just following a set of steps. We then start to think about partial sums. So in partial sums, we're going to add together like place values. So if I have 345 plus 273, I'm going to break these out into the hundreds, the tens, and the ones. So I'm going to say 300 plus 200. So I've got 500. 40 plus 70 equals 110, 5 plus 3 equals 8, 
And so now I'm adding up 500 plus 110. So I have 610 plus eight is 618. So they're taking apart those numbers and they are adding up by place value. And so this kind of comes right before you might see the standard algorithm come in. So if I was doing standard algorithm, I would have 345 plus 273. I'm adding my ones. So five plus three is eight. And when I think about this in standard algorithm, all I'm thinking about is four plus seven is 11. Well, really, that 4 plus 7 is actually 40 plus 70. And we want students to understand that this isn't just a 4 and a 7. It really is 40 plus 70. And so when I get 11, really what that means is 110, right? I've got a 1 in the hundreds place and a 1 in the tens place here. That value is 110. But in our standard algorithm, it's a list of steps. Four plus seven is 11. So my tens number goes there and the ones goes there. I now have three plus two is five plus one more is six. Again, we're talking about hundreds. So that 300 plus 200 was 500. I had this one that I took from my tens when I added them together. That's what I had carried here. So when we start doing partial sums, we're breaking those numbers out so students can understand where those numbers come from. We can then make a connection to our standard algorithm and why we do this as our shortcut. Um, and that it's a list of steps, but they understand where those numbers come from. And it's really important that we work on not just showing our students tricks to do the math. We really want students to understand where those numbers are from so that they have a, a greater understanding of how to apply um, the, the math to a problem that's not always set up in the most standard way. Okay. So those are kind of how we might lead ourselves through the addition strategies. And I talked a little bit about um, fishing for 10 was one of the games that you might use. Um, I'm going to jump back. Let's see if I can do this. So Jen, I yes. have a couple questions from it. the chat box. So there was a question and several people have responded to this question in the chat box. Is there a reason why you didn't group your tally marks in fives? So those actually weren't tally marks. When we were doing it, they were base 10 blocks. And so that is it's a great question. Um, and it's one of those that when we are switching from tally marks to base 10 blocks, we need to make sure that our students understand what we're, we're using um, and that those represent those longs, those base 10 longs. Um, so great question. The other question was, what grade is the open number line introduced and used in? Where do we find that? Um, I think most often you'll see that introduced in grade two um, because in grade one students really are still using the number grid um, as well as truly working on those combinations of 10 and so you wouldn't necessarily see um, the open number line until second grade when you start working with more two-digit numbers. Um, and in first grade, if you're working with two-digit numbers, often it's a two-digit number and you're adding a t uh, either a 10 or 20, you're adding that kind of, um, of number. It's not um, a tens and ones number that you're adding to it. And then the final question was, where do you find fishing for 10? Um, so fishing for 10, if you Google it, you might find it. Um, but again, it is just like go fish. Um, so if I am, um, so if I'm playing, I've got my deck of cards now out in front of me here. So I've got my deck of cards. And if I um, have in my hand the ace, two, and seven, then I would be asking for a number that would make a combination that would make 10. So if I was looking for something to go with the seven, I would ask for a three. 
And so it's just like go fish. If, if the person had it, they would give it to me. I would lay down the three and the seven and say that's 10. If they didn't, they would say go fish and I would, I would select another card. Um, and anytime I got a combination in my hand that made 10, then I would lay that down. So if I had um, these in my hand, if I had the nine and the ace in my hand, I would take that set out because that makes a combination of 10 and I would set it to the side. Um, so you can use um, a regular deck of cards if you take out um, the 10, the jack, king, uh, queen, and king. Um, you could take out the ace, but if you took out the ace to play fishing for 10, you would also have to take out um, the nine because there would be nothing to go with the nine. If you have numeral cards, you could certainly leave in um, a zero if they had a zero in there you could leave in the 10 if you were playing fishing for 10 um, because zero and 10 would be the combination that would make um, make the 10 um, it, but if you only have a regular deck of cards or if students only have a regular deck of cards they would have to take out um, the 10 and, and above but they would leave in the ace to go with the nine Another um, game that you could play with students um, is just, it's like war. We used to play war. Um, so you would, in war, you flip over, you each flip over, you each flip over a card. Whoever had the four would get to keep both of them. Well, if you're practicing addition skills, what you could do is each person could flip over two cards. And I'm now gonna add them up. So. I have an eight and an ace, so that would be nine. In this hand, I have a nine and a three, so that's 12. The person who had the sum of 12 would keep all the cards. So you would just add together those two cards that you had, um, and then whoever had the larger sum would get to keep the cards. If it was a tie, you'd flip two more cards, add them up, whoever had the larger sum there would get to keep all the cards from both rounds. So you could even extend this game for older students um, that would involve a little bit of strategy. So if I wanted to, I could flip four cards. You could even start with three, but I'm gonna flip four cards. This is my hand of cards that I just flipped over. I have two sevens and two threes, and I might want to now make two two-digit numbers and I want to have the largest sum. So in this case, I would pick 73 and 73, these would be my two two-digit numbers, 73 and 73, and now I would add these together and I would get 146. And so you could see where this would definitely be something that you'd want to do with either third or maybe even fourth graders because it involves some strategy. So if I'm playing against somebody, I draw four cards, those were my four cards, Some the partner, picks their four cards, and then they have to look, I picked a six and three fours. So now I have to think about what would give me the largest sum. So in this case, I don't have too much of an option. I would make the number 64 and 44. Now there's nothing wrong with making two two-digit numbers and not thinking about what would give me the largest sum, but eventually students might come up with a strategy like your two largest cards need to be in the tens place because the tens place is more valuable than the ones place. So you would pick your larger cards to become your tens place. Um, but that's a strategy that you could have them work on um, as they're working to add out um, their numbers. So um, that's just a different game. It, it's a lot like war, it's a, it's a comparison game. If you use the program Everyday Math, um, it's called Top It and they start top it in kindergarten and work their way up. Um, different programs call it different things, but essentially it's just getting students to um, use the cards, to add the cards together, make numbers that they're adding together. They then are building in that comparison piece. Now, if you were at home, if a student was at home and you were doing a Zoom call with them, if they had a deck of cards and you had a deck of cards, again, take out the tens, and the face cards, you could then play against each other um, in a virtual meeting with them. Um, so you don't have to be sitting side by side with them. You could play against the student. Um, they would just draw their cards, show you the cards. They, you would show them your cards, um, and then you just set them to the side. 
Um, and then one of the routines that I wanted to share with you, let me see if I can share my screen again here. So this was the game idea. Again, um, using the deck of cards, taking out the 10 through the king, flip the cards in pairs and add, the larger sum keeps the cards. You could also flip four cards, making two two-digit numbers and adding the person with the largest sum keeps all four cards. You could even change the strategy and ask them for the smallest sum. So they have to think about what cards would give them the smallest sum, but you would decide that before you were playing. So the other routine, so that's a game. Um, one of the routines that might have students just practicing is um, a number of the day routine. So if you look at this um, sheet here, the number of the day is 136. So you could do this, you could adjust this for the age group that works best um, for, for you. If you were in first grade, you might have students looking at um, smaller like two digit numbers start with single digit numbers but notice they're finding different ways to write this number or to model this number um, and they're not all just addition problems they might do an addition problem like right here 100 plus 30 plus 6 but this one is 13 tens plus 6 ones or 12 tens plus 16 ones here they modeled the base 10 blocks here they broke out all the tens. So they're um, not actually all the tens, they broke out seven tens. So they have 10 plus 10 plus 10, seven times plus 66. You might say 10 tens and 36 ones. So they even got into this one as a has a multiplication problem. But if you just asked your students to give you even five ways to make a certain number, that may be um, just a way to get students to look at breaking apart numbers and how numbers are put together and, and building on that number sense. Because in all of those strategies for addition that I shared with you, all of them rely on number sense and how you break apart numbers and how you think about numbers. Um, so it's really important to um, get students familiar with different ways to represent numbers. And so, um, even if you're not the classroom teacher and sharing this with your whole class, but if you're working one-on-one -on -one or in a small group, this is something that could easily be done while students might be coming into the room and getting settled. It could be, here's a sticky note and here's your number. And maybe a different student has a different number and they're working on whatever's right for them at, the, at their own, um, for their own skills that they're working on. Um, but you ask them, find five ways that you might represent this number. Um, and so it's just something to get each kid thinking. Jen, we have yes. a couple quick questions. All right. Could you please define subitizing again for us? Sure. Subitizing is when I can look at a group of numbers and recognize that group of numbers without having to count them. So if I look at, for instance, the side of a die, and I see the number five, when I see that pattern, I don't have to count each one of the dots, one, two, three, four, five. I know that that's five just by looking at it. And so we want students to be able to look at things like two, four, three, five, six, in different combinations, in different ways, and to recognize those numbers without having to count each one. So good question. Perfect. The next question is about the slides. Will you be sharing the slides after we're done? Um, so you can always access the slides that I shared um, through the video. So we are recording it. And I know last week I was able to get the video up um, by the next morning by I think eight o'clock, nine o'clock. I had it up on the um, on the website. So you can find the video in lots of different locations. If you got into our meeting today, you had the Zoom link and password. Um, and so I will also link the video right in that document. Um, you can also find it on the math landing page on the DOE website. And you can also find it on the DOE website under the COVID-19 um, for teachers. When you go to the for teachers, there's actually um, an area that says um, professional learning for ed techs. And when you click on that, that'll be linked in there as well. So um, the video is a, a YouTube video. You can pull it up. You can pause it. You can take a look at um, our whole presentation all over again. I know everything happens so quickly. Um, we have such a short amount of time to do that. 
So this next question, um, they want to know uh, how long does the video stay active on the DOE website? And I'm not sure of that answer. I think it's as long as we leave it there. I think it's as long as we leave it there. And if you got into the meeting today, you will always have access to the document that has our Zoom links. And so if you bookmarked that, you can go back to it because I will leave it um, in there and that document just sits in my Google Drive somewhere. So you'll have access to it. The video itself is actually part of um, the DOE's YouTube site. And so um, it'll, it'll stay there. It's on YouTube now or will be on YouTube once it gets posted. Any other questions, Michelle? Did we kind of get through most of them? We got them all. I've been writing them down. And when you pause, I've been throwing out the ones that needed to be addressed. Excellent. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, so I will now share with you, I'm going to share back the screen again. Um, and oh, let's see. So here is the survey link. I will post the survey link in the chat box. Um, if I can get it open here for everyone. So I just posted it. Ooh, it went in as a hyperlink. You should be able to just click that link this time. We've been having trouble with, um, well, it's a setting um, through Zoom, but you should be able to click that bit.ly link that was underlined. I just put it in in blue. It should go right to the survey. Um, if you um, have your phone open, you could take a picture. When you go to take the picture of the QR code, again, it will pop up. Um, do you want to visit this website? And so you can certainly go, um, go there um, and it will allow you to do the survey or you can type in, if you grab that bit.ly link from the top there, you can type that in the address bar of um, like if uh, any search, anywhere you go, the website, if you open up a new tab, just type that in. Sometimes you might only have to type in um, the bit.ly slash to and the, the, the code, you may leave out the HTTPS colon slash slash um, if you're typing it into the address bar. Some people have been able to do it that way, some have not. And so um, there's a couple of different ways that you can access that. So I will try put there. I posted it again in our chat box. Um, so if you want to click on that link, you can um, so there's do that. Two, two questions in the chat box. The first sure. one I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer for you. The question was about CEUs. Um, we are not providing CEUs. What we are providing are contact hours. CEUs are done in collaboration with the university system, and you would have to pay and do additional coursework to get a CEU. But your time here with us, we give you a contact hours, which also can be used for recertification. So, and then the other question is, do you only subitize numbers one through six? No, actually you might subitize um, the numbers. So I think about the tens frame. If I had a full tens frame, I wouldn't need to count those. I could recognize that as a 10 right away. I also could look at that if there was one missing and I could recognize that that was nine without having to count them. So subitizing really is just the being um, that you're able to recognize a, a group of objects um, without having to count them. Um, but typically it's a small group of objects, even though I might look at a tens, uh, a grouping of base 10 blocks, um, I still might have to count out the tens and then some more ones. Um, so that would not be considered subitizing. But if I look at those ones and I go, oh, there's only four of them, that would be this piece that it would be subitizing. So you may subitize um, some numbers up through 10 probably I would say um, subitizing and I'm I'm seeing that the link worked so much better this time so I'm glad that that's working for everybody hi I'm Kelly Johnson I it's not doing anything for me same as last week and this week I'm clicking on that link I've clicked on the scan but nothing it just stays put Sorry. Okay. Nope, that's okay. I'm going to stop share for just a moment because I'm going to 